Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the final session of the final day of the Re Festival at the Department of Dreams. Um, we're really sorry that we're running late, but we've had a few tech issues, and Kadisha has figured out the most like DIY brilliant way to be here. So thank you so much, Kadisha, for for doing that. Um, we've got an incredible session, right? And and I'm just going to tell you a little bit because I feel like ever since I've met Sham, um, like my thoughts on everything have just changed. Um, she is literally a just, I think she came out of the room, uh, just a revolutionary. Her story is so powerful and what she's doing with it is so powerful. Um, and um, I'm really, really excited to invite both Sham and Ravimbo who are um, founders of um, A is for Activism. They're going to tell you all about that. I know they're going to do their like get on the Insta, do all of that stuff because they do it so well. Um, and they're also going uh, to tell you more about their wonderful special guest, Kadisha, who um, will be talking uh, today as well. So the name of the session is Things I Imagined, A Future Without Policing. And I couldn't think of a more important, more um, critical and transformational conversation for this this last evening um, and I'm incredibly grateful for all of you who are tuning in and for, for those of you who are coming into the final session. So I'm going to hand over to Sham, Ravimbo and Kandisha but first over to Sham and I'm going to just be in the background soaking it all in and I'll see you later for questions and for wrapping up. So um, yeah, settle in, enjoy and be pre prepared to have your mind blown. Over to you Sham and Ravimbo and Kandisha. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to start off the session just by reading um, Harlem by Langston Hughes and the poem goes, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a saw and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? I think I wanted to read that poem just because I think we are witnessing a dream deferred exploding. We are seeing mass protests across the entire nation. We're seeing protests globally um, about injustices that black, black and brown people are facing. I'll tell you a little bit about us as an organization. A's for Activism is a voluntary not-for-profit organisation that started as a book club and then morphed into something greater than we had imagined. We welcome all who are disenfranchised. We hope to bring like-minded people together in order to work collectively towards building a stronger and more enlightened community. We reject Western principles of individual individualism and foster a culture of collectivism. We are all interconnected, we need each other, and we can only fight against oppressive forces if we are unified. We believe we are not proprietors of knowledge. We believe knowledge is not for us to harness, for ego, or for power, it is to be shared. Which is why we will always say that we are first and foremost a book club, because the, book, the blueprint is there for us. We have the likes of James Baldwin, Langston Hughes, Angela Davis, Living Legend, Claudia Jones, we have so many people that have literally talked about everything that we're experiencing now and have given us a path out. All we need to do is just band together and do something with those tools. Beautiful. Good evening all. Welcome to our workshop on a future without policing and without prisons. We're very grateful that you can all join with us today. And I know that for many of us right now, um, this is your first introduction to, I guess, I suppose, a more radical politic politics. So welcome, solidarity. These past few weeks, I suppose, have opened many of us to some uncomfortable truths. It's the first time people have found out that the institutions which have pro promised to protect us have now had their bail removed and have been exposed to the truths which they hold, which is killing and incarcerating black people at a disproportionate rate. By abolish the police and by abolish the prisons, we mean building a world that does not rely on anti-black white supremacist institutions to regulate our society, but rather creating several alternatives that form order to replace it, such as community care networks, which can be providing and can um, have justice, which is stored and rooted in restoration and rehabilitation rather than this 
focus on punishment. The criminalization of black people and blackness, as no secret reflected in the prison industrial complex, is an extension of slavery and the slave economy and anti-blackness globally. We've been fooled in these common times into believing that crime or criminal activities are singular rare events, which in fact statistically has been proven to be tied into um, low socioeconomic societies. So it's not a case particularly um, between good versus evil or right versus wrong. It's a case of the haves and the haves nots. Franz Fanon once wrote, who's one of our favorite writers at the book club, um, a quote saying, in the colonies, it is the policeman and the soldier who are the official institution, instituted go-betweens, the spokesman of the settler and his rule of the oppression. And that's what the police of today are. And that's what prisons are. It is a gateway for the oppression to continue existing and no more than that. There is nothing and absolutely nothing more dehumanizing than our incarceral system. And the idea by which means um, when people recommend reforming it, it cannot work. And one of our favorite writers also is a man named George Jackson um, was right when he said that reform is another form of fascism. And by that we mean over the last hundred years, colonialism and white supremacist institutions have not been completely destroyed. It has only reformed itself. And with each reform, it has only revealed its true insidious nature um, and hidden it and made it more discreet and threatened our positions even more. But I guess, I suppose in a more friendlier face, we cannot reform white supremacy. We cannot reform capitalist, capitalism and we cannot reform our current policing, um, policing and our prisons. We can only collectively work to destroy it. Prisons were not institutionalized on this ridiculously large scale by the people, but rather most people understand that crime is deeper and more complex than the good and the bad guys. Crime is a result of a grossly disproportionate distribution of wealth and privilege, as George Jackson has previously said. And imprisonment is the aspect of class struggle from the outset. Throughout its history, both the UK and the US have also used prisons as a means to suppress any organized efforts to challenge its legitimacy, pre-colonial and post-colonial um, time. So in the US, we saw imprisonment being used as a tool during the Red Scare, um, where they imprisoned communists um, at their attempts to disband the Black Panther Party. And it's been a tool to undermine marginalized communities. The system hasn't failed. And this is why we say reform can't work. The system is doing exactly what it's designed to do, which is killing black people, which is incarcerating brown children at detention camps. And I say that to say this, um, so I can introduce our first speaker. People think that police brutality and these issues are solely a US issue. It's not. In the West Midlands, the police mantra is, quote unquote, preventing crime, protecting the public and helping those in need. But for many of us who have seen what the police have done to our communities, understand that they arbitrarily failed in that. So we thought it's important to have our first speaker discuss their personal experiences with the West Midlands Police and how unbelievably corrupt they are. So I'd like to welcome Kadisha Brown Burrell, who is the founder of the Kingsley Burrell Campaign and the sister of a custody death victim, Kingsley Burrell from Birmingham. Her intention from the very beginning is to connect black people from all over the UK who have shared, um, who have shared experiences, lobby to members of parliament and raise our concerns collectively for justice to be served. Thank you, Sham, for introducing me. Okay, the struggle is real. The struggle is not as easy as, as one may think. In terms of moving forward, it's like there's over 6,000 people who have died in police custody since 1969, and one person's ever been convicted before. It's systematic. It's more to do with institutions themselves direct. Um, we've been fighting this fight for over nine years now, and we're not any far forward than we were nine years ago in terms of accountability, laws that need to be changed in Parliament. Not only that, it goes to show how this, the system continue to fail fam families time and time again. I travel to London every single year. We always travel to, to 
Westmin Westminster, 10 Downing Street, to hand in our notice to the Prime Minister. Not once the Prime Minister has ever acknowledged our letters and say, OK, let's have a discussion around this. So obviously it's an institutional failure. And not only that, they don't want to recognise what's happening here within the UK. I went to America in 2015 on behalf of Black Lives Matter. And there was four of us that travelled just to share our stories and what's going on within the UK. That's alongside Stephanie Lightfoot Bennett. Her brother was murdered by the police. Sean Hall, which is Mark Duggan's brother, which a lot of people are aware about Mark Duggan and what happened after his death with the riots in Tottenham, and myself for Kingsley Burrell. So we've been campaigning for how many years and the system never ever acknowledges what they've done wrong. It all, became, it all stems from systematic racism, institutional racism, that's where it actually lies. And a lot of um, families do not get the answers that they're looking for from the inquest, from the criminal justice system, within the CPS, and even to prosecute. There's only two cases that's actually turned up to be um, prosecution, and that was my case, Kingsley Burrell, and, um, and, and um, Stephanie Lightfoot Bennett, Bennett's brother. But it just goes to show we managed to get a perjury trial. The whole point of having a perjury trial is for the, because there's a, there's a criminal conviction that needs to be done. When it comes to trial, I'm sorry to say, but the jury lets go every single one of the police officers. Officer was act. And that was for integrity, dishonesty. So there's a lot of families who are grieving in order for justice, and justice is never to be seen or heard or even done. Hence the reason why we just have to do campaigning. But as far as I'm concerned, it has to change from bottom grassroots level until grassroots level it changes the whole structure needs to be changed um sham was saying earlier in terms of where do we go from here in terms of the systematic failures it needs to be the bottom up are the ones that's going to make that change happen no absolutely um and thank you for sharing that so for many people in the West Midlands who don't exactly know who Kingsley is or what particularly happened without having to divulge anything you don't want to. Um, are you still with us, Khadija? Yes, I am. Okay, yeah, perfect. Can you just tell um, people about that a little bit more and how they can get involved? Because I know you guys have a website, so it's important to share that and any upcoming campaigns that you also have. Okay, on that note, um, we have his website up and running, which is called kingsleyburrell.co.uk or kingsleyburrell.com. There's been a lot of things happening in the press. We managed to keep it in the press from the very outset from he died. So basically what happened in 2011, which was March, Kingsley was in a gang gang area in Birmingham. He called the police for help. When the police arrived, they said he was delusional and held him under the 136. All they needed to do was just look on the CCTV evidence to confirm what he was saying was true. The police didn't do that. What they did instead was held him under 136 while he was with his four-year-old son in Birmingham. Carried him to a place of safety, done their assessment on him without the family's knowledge. Kingsley didn't have no history of mental health illness whatsoever. However, they managed to take him from a place of safety and section him. So within a 72 hour frame, there was a big disturbance at the mental health unit where Kingsley was staying. That disturbance came about because myself, my mom and the mental health solicitor, we all had an appointment to see him at 4 p.m. Unfortunately, the staff stated to Kingsley, stated to us, the family, that he doesn't want to see us. I said, I don't believe you guys. I just want us to hear my brother tell me direct and we'll leave. The members of staff stated to us that, oh, sorry, we can't do that. So we just actually left. We actually left the premises. As we left the premises, I had a phone call from my sister to say, did you not go and see Kingsley? Because there's a disturbance on the unit. And they, he's, they're stating to her that they're not going to have anyone threatening their staff members. Lo and behold, the same police officers that dealt with him on a Sunday came again and dealt with him again on the Wednesday. He was face down, hands behind his back tasered he was he was basically the way he was treated he would even treat your own animal in that in that way 
He was hands behind his back, leg restraints, arm restraints, and they had a blanket towel covering the whole of his head. So even when Kingsley mentioned to the men, the, the staff, that he cannot that wasn't counted for. So when it came to the criminal trial now, the police were stating that they did not see the blanket cap covering around Kingsley's head or him, or him even stay, saying out loud that he cannot bleed, breathe. It was all documented in the criminal court which we had for perjury and dishonesty. And they were able to get away with that at the end of the criminal trial because they were all acquitted. When it came out of that criminal trial, we went to a misconduct hearing and the same issues arise again with all the testimonies all the witnesses once again and it came apparent that the main police officer which was at the top end of Kingsley should have removed the towel from around his head hence the reason why he was sacked that's not good enough for us as a family because at the end of the day that's the reason we we had a criminal trial the criminal trial is not in our favor trial the families do not even give legal aid in order for our barristers not forgetting that these officers have the top barristers, the top lawyers, and everybody's on their side. When it comes to the family, we are victims in this, but yet still we feel like what we've got to say or what we've got to do is never counted for because they always have their own narrative, their own story in order to get these police officers off. Not forgetting that they always act with impunity so that whatever they've been questioned when, when it comes to the criminal trial, it seems as if, Okay, that doesn't matter. Just get the, just get, don't get the facts across. Just get the, the information across in order for us to get off. And that's how they got off time and time again. But we as a family will continue the campaign. And we know we've got the support of the community behind us in order for, to drive forward change. And that's what we need, change within the government system, with the economic structure. And we have to move together collectively. Thank you. Remember, we'll now um, follow on from that. Thank you so, so much for sharing that experience, Khadija. I'm like shaking, hearing it over all over again, even though, you know, quite familiar with the case being from Birmingham and having read about it and heard about it in the, read about it in the newspapers. But as you can see, where police are called to help people within marginalized communities, they instead put them in danger. And a large part of this is because of how police are trained. Police are not trained to help at the first instant. They are trained to always be on the defensive. So any uncertainty is met with force when it comes with, to police. And that is not um, an accident. The police exist to fabricate social orders that, and that order is built upon systems of exploitation. Mark Neocleus wrote that. When elites feel threatened, they rely on police to control these activities, movements, public expressions, and public expressions of raid. So just bringing this back to recently, kettling at the London protest, we had um, police on horseback and then we also had um, military policing in Ferguson in the recent protest. Despite demands for reform, reformation, the police functions to manage the poor, foreign, non-white, and on behalf of a system of economic and political inequality. In order for us to truly understand how ideology, ideology functions in our society, we need to talk about um, the fact that the concept of ideology started within Marxism. Marx looked at ideology within feudal economies. A feudal system is in an economic structure where the serfs, the peasants, worked for the land, for the lord or the king in exchange for a portion of land. Ideology reflects the interest of the ruling classes and maintains the status quo that keeps them in power. Ideology is internalized not just by the elites, but by the masses. What I mean by that is neoliberals, truly believe that this is the way things are and this is the way things are supposed to be, that we are supposed to have police, we are supposed to have um, prisons. We all internalize the status quo and it is then justified through racism, law, myths and religion. Those ideologies are then reinscribed through social codes of conduct to essentially prepare you to enter the capitalist machine and revolutions and rebellions are threats to that status quo. 
French Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser identified two forms of apparatus that basically are there to keep us in check, keep us motivated, and keep us motivated to behave appropriately. The first being the repressive, and that run that is that governs you through fear. So that's the police, that's the courts, that's the prison. And then you have ideology. Ideology is the leading apparatus because we all want to belong to a certain social group to be accepted and to feel normal that is why it's so influential he identified what he called ideological state apparatuses and they function to prevent change from the status quo isas are the academic institution the church and the media the media serve as an amplifier turning up the volume on certain voices recommending and certain critiques and rendering other people silence these institutions spread bourgeois ideology and ensure that the proletariat remain in their state of false class consciousness. An example being the fact that the British working class voted against their own interest in recent elections. Politics is again another example of an ideological state apparatus. You have the illusion of choice in most elections. You can either vote for the status quo but make it a little bit more environmentally friendly or you can vote for the status quo but make it a little bit less fascist but then again that's also a question mark because the less fascist option we had was labor but they're also very racist the purpose of ideological state apparatuses is to avert you from the real problems if you're preoccupied you don't have to think about inequality you don't have to think about fighting the status quo and if you do have to do it you have to do it through the official channels which is funny because the official channels are designed to make sure that you don't get the justice that you deserve, just as we heard Kadisha talk about. One of the um, one of the main ideological state apparatuses is um, the education system. Altusa wrote, "No other ideological state apparatus has the obligatory and least and not least free audience of the totality of children in the capitalist social formation." eight hours a day for five or six days out of seven. The purpose of the school system is not only to teach you to read, write, add and subtract, but to teach you discipline. Everything is guarded by rules, regulations, and an authority figure enforces those, said, those rules and regulations. If you don't follow the rules, you get punished. Detention, phone calls to your parents, isolation, you are threatened with some sort of force. That's the repressive coming into play. The ideology is the school system preparing you to be a cog in the capitalist system. Just think about how um, schools are laid out. You have the students in rows and then the teacher at the front of the board, your authority figure. Think about how the in courts, the judge is at the front, everybody else is in rows. In lectures, everybody else at the back, the lecturer at the front. In churches, the pastor, the preacher man, at the front, everybody else in roles. We are all subjects of, within ideology, whether we are free or in prison, we are still part of it, we are inside it. And that is why it's, it's part of the neoliberal agenda for, uh, for them to make us believe that reformation is the only way. It's not, but because we are indoctrinated and taught within this ideology, we believe that, you know, the only way to have a safe society is to have police and that police were there to um, protect us and not to quell protests, not to silence the voices of the masses, not to protect the interests of the elite. Hand it over to Sham to continue the next portion. So when it comes to understanding um, our reliance on the police and their existence, I suppose, in making sure they funnel as many black and brown people into prisons um, till today. It's important to understand that um, in these decades of deindustrialization we've had, in racial discrimination we've had, in housing and in employment rights going down, and the growing in income inequality have created pockets of intense poverty where jobs are scarce public services are inadequate and crime and violence is widespread. These aren't, these aren't mere coincidences. Even with 
intensive over policing and the amount of drastic, um, the drastic amounts of people we've had being put into prison. People don't feel any safer. Young people continue to use violence as a means for predation and protection. And then when, as Kadisha horribly pointed out, when people do call the police, they, they don't serve to protect black and brown communities. And any programs for reducing crime or enhancing social well-being, much less achieving racial justice, has to address these issues because you can't address the issue of crime without addressing the issue of poverty. No one on the political stage is seriously talking about this reality. And it's why we wanted to funnel this conversation in because the, the blueprints exist for this, whether it's Angela Davis, whether it's um, Alex Vitae, whether it's George Jackson, these blueprints for a world without policing exist. Um, and then when we look at the question of the US in particular and their relationship with incarceration, Racial segregation in the US is as bad as it is today, as it's ever been. Poor communities need better housing, jobs, and access to social health and recreational and educational services, not more money into police and jails. Yeah, that's the only thing that's on offer in the country. And people forget it was the Democrats that enforced the horrifying drug laws that only further incarcerated Black people. So again, this idea of bringing a liberal, happy face of reform. It, it, it cannot exist. You cannot reform fascism. Reforming fascism is still fascism. And again, it's important to um, understand the relationship between police and prisons. And all of it is about profit. And I know it's tired to consistently come and go back on our anti-capitalist critique. But prisons literally make the wealthy elite millions of dollars every year. And then when we look at the statistics, and these are a few statistics that have been drawn up from the New Jim Crow, there are more African-Americans under correctional um, control today in prisons or jails on probation or parole than there were enslaved in 1850, which is a decade before the Civil War even began. As of 2004, more African-American men were disenfranchised due to felon disenfranchisement laws than in 1870, um, the year that the 15th Amendment was ratified, prohibiting laws which deny the right to vote on the basis of race, but now you can be denied the right to vote on the basis of your convictions. And it's again, it's no coincidence that the people who are being convicted are Black people at a proportional rate. A Black child being born today is less likely to be raised by both parents than a Black child born in during slavery. Um, the recent disintegration of the African-American family is due in large part to mass imprisonment of black fathers. And then if you take into account prisoners, a large majority of African-American men in some urban areas have been labeled as felons for life. And this is particularly the case in Chicago. It's almost at 80%. And these men are a part of a growing undercast. And it's really important that Michelle Alexander, the writer of the New Jim Crow, uses the word undercast not class, caste, because they're permanently relegated by law to second class status through being denied the right to vote, through being automatically excluded from juries, um, lacking in access to employment, housing, education. And these are these are very legal discriminations against them. And um, as much as their grandparents and great grandparents were during the Jim Crow era, they are still being um, subjected to the same kind of abuse in the same way. And the reason why I had begun with this is because we kind of wanted to have um, one of our very good comrades from Philly, Stephen, come and speak about his time during incarceration. Unfortunately, um, Stephen is literally out there fighting fascists right now, like he's literally punching up some Nazis as we speak because um, the alt-right decided to have a rally in Philadelphia and they said no, they're basically going to counteract that. So he will be making us a video to talk about his time in incarceration, addressing things such as um, whether he felt rehabilitated at all, short answer, he didn't, whether um, how racism within prisons itself work because not only are black and brown people um, forced into prison but White people in prisons obviously have better jobs in prisons than 
black people. So who gets to be the cooks in prisons and who gets to be, um, who gets to clean the bathrooms and the showers and the toilets, etc. cetera. Um, and he'll be addressing a few really important things. So we'll kind of have to talk about solutions in particular. Now, after hearing um, Kadisha's testimony and then once you hear Stephen's videos, it can't be denied that the incarceration system and the police institution as a whole does nothing but oppress and marginalize for communities even further. And not only does it oppress them, but it profits off their deaths and exploitation. It makes millions of dollars and millions of pounds, whether we're talking about G4S, whether we're talking about um, APAC, etc. These, these lobbyists get to make millions of dollars off the exploitation and the humiliation and the degradation of black lives. So whilst me and remember were searching, etc., we wanted to make sure that we didn't just create our own solutions to this. Because as we said earlier, there are blueprints which exist already. And we're gonna kind of go one by one through the um, steps from the Eight Can't Wait campaign which is an abolitionist campaign proposing radical alternatives. And Ravimba will follow with the first one. <laughs> Thank you, Sham. Um, the first is defund the police. We first must reject any proposed ex expansion to police budgets, prohibit private public innovation schemes that profit from temporary technological fixes to systemic problems of police abuse and violence. For example, the body cams. These contracts and data sharing arrangements are lethal. I know that Axon, um, the company that makes the tasers and also is making the body cams, actually reported the fact that they have started making more money from the body cams and are set to probably make more than um, the tasers were worth. At the moment, as of 19th June, 2020, that company is worth 5.3 billion. We need to reduce the power of police unions. Until the police are, poli are fully defunded, police union contracts negotiations must be made public. We need to pressure um, government to denounce police unions. We need to prohibit city candidates taking money from police unions and stop accepting in union funds. Withhold pensions and not rehire cops involved in use of excessive force, a lot of people just get moved from one department to another. Demand the highest budget cuts across um, across policing per year until they slash that budget to zero. We need to slash police cut salaries across the board until they're zeroed out. Immediately fire police officers who have any excessive force complaints. Not hire any new officers or replace officers that are fired or resigned, fully cut the funding for um, public relations, suspend the use of paid administrative leave for police that are under investigation, no investment in police training, no investment in police facility renovations, deplatform white supremacist public officials, CC, do you know what, CC everyone, um, the president of the United States included in that, our own buffoon included in that, repeal the law enforcement bill of rights and all police contracts with social services, care services and government agencies providing cares. And it does, it really doesn't make sense because why do you have someone who is a trained um, mental health worker next to police who are obviously going to lead to using force? Um, just as we heard in the case of, you know, Kingsley Burrell. We need to abolish asset forfeiture programs and laws. Now moving on to number two, which is demilitarizing the police. So as we see in today's society, police scanners, tasers, most worryingly, I will note, increased data collecting and sharing. And Amazon has been selling your data to, um, to the police. These ancestry companies that have asked for your DNA to track back however many years have been selling your DNA to the police and other pharmaceuticals. Um, also SWAT teams, gang injections, stop and frisk, um, 
quality of life ticketing. All these police reforms have been taken up to, I guess, improve the idea of policing in the United States and the UK, but all it's done is degrade and humiliate marginalized communities further. So when it comes to demilitarizing the police, it means disarming law enforcement officers, including the police and private um, security. So police in our um, national senses in the US and in the UK and private security companies on the abstract global sense. So Blackwater in Iraq, demilitarize them instantly. And the militarization of black and brown neighborhoods by ending broken windows policing, precision policing, community policing, and all other iterations of quality of life policing. Uh, remove cops from hospital, prohibit law enforcement's access to private patient information, acknowledge that the surveillance technology such as CCTV, face printing, DNA, biometric databases, acoustic gunshot detection, drones, which were seen in our last few protests in Birmingham, AI and risk profile, profiling algorithms, and other forms of predictive policing, which is the hugest issue we face in Big Brother UK right now. We're on, in, under consistent surveillance. And all of these are a weapon of the law enforcement. And they must instantly end these police contracts with private companies that provide these services and prohibit the experiment design and rollout in the house systems. Security companies such as G4S has made 10.2 billion on the idea of securing your homes or making you safer. For those who don't know, G4S is the third largest company in the world. It only follows after Walmart. That's how rich they are. And that their very consensus is based on the idea of creating threats which don't exist. And they lobby for that, mind you. Um, furthermore, withdraw participation in police mil militarization programs and refuse federal grants from the US to the UK that entangle municipal police entities with the Department of Homeland Security, with the MI5, with any terrorism task forces, and especially with the FBI. Prohibit training exchanges between the US law enforcement or the UK of law enforcement and different global military and police entities, such as the IDF. The Israeli police and army are infamously known to be to give these horrifying training programs to other soldiers or other police officers globally because their very existence is based on the model of Palestinian subjugation and they enforce that globally. Um, it's called the Kubak Manual. Um, so ensuring that these relationships circulate deadly tech, um, techniques and technologies, exporting the American and Israeli model of racist policing worldwide are destroyed. And then also repeal all that hide, excuse or enable police misconduct. And that includes from the top down governance that we've seen and this and the cover-ups that we've seen especially with the king liberal case we also need to the third is removing police from schools so in america they have the school to prison pipeline in 2005 at fairview elementary school three officers arrested a five-year-old black girl after teachers failed to calm her down during a tantrum. Now, in February 2020, Kaya Roll, a six-year-old, was restrained with zip ties after having a tantrum and hitting school workers. By the time the two officers had arrived to the school, at the school, she was calm, but they still detained a six-year-old. There is a video and it's quite distressing. I wouldn't recommend watching it, so I'll explain it to you. She was already having a book read to her um, the body cam footage of shows them um, pleading, shows her pleading, please don't do that, don't, don't put me in um, cuffs. And the worker that was there asked them, is there any need for you to put her in those, um, the restraints? And the, the man said, the man had the nerve to say that um, if she was bigger, I'd be putting her in handcuffs. No empathy, you are not seeing that this is, this is a child. She's six years old. There is a reason why she's acting in that way. In the year of 2013 and 14, there were 43,000 school-based police officers 
in the United States, 69% of those engage in school discipline enforcement. They're not there to protect students. They're not there to protect everybody else. And school shootings are still happening despite them being present, but that's another story. In the 90s, the Justice Department in America allocated $750 billion to hire 65,000 officers for the Cops in Schools program. Consequently, there have been more arrests of students within the schools. Now, let's come back to home here, where we are. In the UK, we have Prevent. Prevent is, is a counter-terrorist program that started many, many years ago, but um, they only just started revealing what it entails recently. So 5,738 um, students were referred to Prevent in the year ending um, 31st of March, 2019. The education se sector accounted for the highest number of those referrals. I think it was like 33%, 1,887. So I want you guys to um, play spot the signs with me. Put your finger up if any of these apply to you. These are signs of you being at risk of radicalization. A desire for political, social or moral change. Feeling under, tr under threat. The need for identity, meaning and belonging. Feelings of grievances and injustice changing your hair a sudden change of fashion if you have put your hang up hand up you will now be referred to as a high risk student and be reported to prevent as someone who may be radicalized i think that speaks for most people in this room you're you're in this space for a reason you're here because you now understand that black and brown people are under threat they're at the threat of violence. They are being killed disproportionately. They're being killed for existing. They're being killed for buying sweets in the shop. They're being killed for playing in the park. They're being killed for having, um, you know, tickets. They're just being killed for existing. These are the three, these are the traits that they look for as indicators of radicalization. And they are racist. They are racist. Look at the way in which um, black people are policed in schools about having their hair in locks. The efficacy of prevent strategies has already been called into question because it disrupts people's um, disrupts students' learning. This is why um, Muslims have been disproportionately reported to prevent because again, how these teachers that are functioning within this ideology that is racist see terrorists as being brown despite the fact that we're having we are seeing the rise of neo-fascists in this country how come it is mostly brown people that are being um seen as being radicalized or at risk of being a terrorist we need to remove police from both public and private schools we need to call upon university to university to dissolve uh, i can't speak to dissolve relationships with police departments minneapolis university recently ended a contract um for using police at large pro large events i can't remember which university it was i had it written down but um when the queen was attending reported and even like cut off access to students um on the campus on that day students that had been identified as being um too radical we need to prohibit police departments from using city contracts with universities to do data analysis geographic and community profiling human commuter computer amelioration studies and predictive analytics instead we need those funds to be diverted into service related studies and community collaborations we need to remove surveillance tech and metal disc detectors from school we need to disconnect property taxes from school funding, and we need to end zero tolerance disciplinary um, policies that are also not used um, fairly across the board. It's zero tolerance for black and brown kids, but bullying and being racist to black children, um, for example, the school in Loughborough, where 
um, people are speaking out about the vile racist abuse that they've suffered. Um, have a, it's crazy. And we need to end the use of carceral light punishment of students, including suspensions and expulsions that disproportionately target black and brown students, especially black girls. We need to urge states to repeal truancy laws. We need to prohibit the surveillance of brown and black students by their teachers, counselors, and school officials through programs that criminalize students and exploit relationships of trust with school officials. How can you say that the person who is probably going to report you, how can you trust to tell someone that you're in danger, that someone is, you know, you're, you're potentially being groomed to someone who's gonna report you? There is not, it's not a safe space. But yeah, um, Sham's gonna continue. Number four, we must free all people from jails and prisons. And one very obvious and very urgent aspect of the work of decriminalization is associated with the defense of all immigrant rights. The growing number of immigrants, especially since the um, attacks on September 11, who are incarcerated in immigration detention centers, as well as in jails and prisons, um, cannot be halted without dismantling the processes that punish people for their failure of entering this country without documentation. And current campaigns that call for decriminalization of undocu undocumented immigrants are making it important to understand that the contributions to all the overall struggle against the prison industrial complex as a whole and are challenging the extensive reach of racism and male domination. And I wanna make this abundantly clear you cannot be pro-migrants and be pro-prisons. It's impossible. You cannot believe that migrants deserve safe and communal spaces here, and then also be for the things that incarcerate them in the first place. And when talking about certain um, statistics, especially in the US and the UK context, I think it's important. So in the last couple of years, ICE has lost track of lost track, I must add, of 1,500 migrant children who have just vanished. That's 3,000 parents who have lost their children. On average, a child dies every week under ICE custody. And these are not coincidences. Trump's anti-migrant policies are not coincidences. It's nothing short of state-sanctioned genocide. And in the UK, it's no better, mind you. When you parallel the people who died in Yarswood Detention Center to those of ICE, it, it's, it's preposterously similar. There are people in Yarswood right now that are living in complete fear because of the COVID outbreaks, because of the fact that they've watched their friends died under detention camp. So you cannot harm people at such insidious rates bomb their family members, steal from them, etc. And then once they try and come here for a good life, just to then incarcerate them because they weren't born in the borders you believe in, that you created even. So then we'll go on to the next recommendation. Now, the fifth recommendation is that we repeal laws that criminalize survival. People adapt their behaviors to a dysfunctional environment where unemployment, violence, entrenched poverty, are the norm. Even after 20 years of declining crime rates, there are neighbors where violence remains a major, a major problem. These areas are extremely poor, racially segregated, and geographically and socially isolated. The response of many cities has been to just pump more and more police into these places. We need to repeal local ordinances that criminalize people involved in the sex trade drug trades and street economy. At the moment, police officers have been reported to coerce sex workers. I know currently there is um, a case where the DC police was um, anonymously reported to have coerced a trans sex worker um, to, to, have, to perform sexual acts so as um, in exchange for them not to basically arrest them, which is disgusting. Repeal local ordinances that criminalize the occupation of public spaces, particularly for people experiencing homelessness. So that includes loitering, 
loitering for the purposes of sex work, fair beating, panhandling, soliciting, camping, sleeping, public urination, and defecation. Give them home. Refuse to deploy police when they are contacted in relation to the above. Repeal statutes that criminalize survivors of gendered violence, including mandatory arrest and failure to protect laws. On the road to complete decriminalization, immediately decriminalize, decriminalize all misdemeanor offenses, which account for about 80% of um, all the cases in the court dockets. End all fines and fees associated with the criminal legal process, including ticketing, cash bail, court costs, costs and um, parole and probation fees. Sham will lead you to the sixth. Number six, invest in community self-governance. Indigenous communities have historically, for centuries, taught us the effectiveness, effectiveness of community self-governance. It is the unchecked powers of the government and the police that allow their crimes to continue. Some campaigns, such as Justice, Justice Coalition's 1% advocates for just 1%, which is roughly $100 million, be diverted from the Los Angeles Police Department budget and be directed to services for young people that are alternatives to youth suppression, of course. Similarly, Los Angeles Community Actions um, Network share the wealth campaign advocates for investments to be equitably distributed from the LAPD um, or from Los Angeles's downtown neighborhoods. Again, a very unjust redistribution of wealth um, be taken to other communities so that they benefit from, so all residents benefit without displacement of fear from the police violence. And given, an ad, um, given adequate resources and the opportunity to develop, imagine what in, incremental shifts can happen once these funding um, prioritizes us rather than policing. Um, similarly, the Maasai warriors in Kenya enforced um, isolation during COVID-19 crisis. They did a much better job than those in the imperial West without, without the need to having to um, arrest en masse or push people into jails, which will only further expose them to COVID. They did it through community guidelines. And in September 2015, organizers with the Oakland chapter Critical Resistance, um, which works to abolish prison and policing, launched what was called the Oakland Power Projects. And the OPP, basically, their initiative aim is to build up capacity for Oakland residents to reject police and policing as a default response to harm and to highlight and create alternatives that actually work by identifying the current harms, amplifying the existing resources they have and developing new strategies and new practices that don't rely on policing solutions. And what they actually did, according to Critical Resistance website, is create very positive results. Because again, once marginalized communities call the police, they could easily be in danger as Kadisha um, highlighted earlier. So further on that, the eight can't wait recommends promoting neighborhood councils as a representative bodies within municipal decision-making, invest in multilingual resources for immigrant and asylum seeking communities because all of this has to be accessible for all. Assess communities' needs and invest in community-based resources, including the from tenants unions to local shop owners and street vendors and prioritizing those marginalized groups. Invest in land stewardship councils to oversee the return of land to all indigenous communities. Invest in community-based public safety approaches, including non-carceral violence prevention and intervention programs and skills-based education on bystander intervention, consent and boundaries and healthy relationships. I know that there was a video and this is a very important one to note. There was a video a couple of years ago that went absolutely viral. And it was in the US and it was this um, strong black Muslim brother, yeah, who saw these two kids that were about to fight and all the other kids had their phones recording. And not only did he intervene, not only did was there bystander intervention, he ended up having the ability to speak them, make them speak it out and shake hands. And they went all over the news, all over um, the US. 
So there are structures and there are role models within our communities to be able to take this role of leadership and ensure the safety of their and protection of their marginalized communities instead of the police. And now then we'll come with number seven. The seventh is we need to provide safe housing for everybody. Cancel rent without burden of repayment, especially during the COVID-19 crisis. We need to repurpose empty buildings, houses, apartments. There's a big, big, big house in, I think it's called Buckingham Palace. Anyway, apartments, hotels to house people experiencing homelessness, prohibit evictions, remove police from all re-entry and shelter institutions, provide unequivocal support and resources to refugee and asylum seeking communities, allow community benefits agreements to be a community government means of urban planning, make public housing accessible to everyone, repealing discriminatory laws, barring people from accessing resources based on income, race, sexuality, immigration status, or history of incarceration support and promote the existence of community land trusts for black and historically placed communities. Run me my check, like it's ensure that survivors of gendered violence have access to alternative housing op options in the event that their primary housing becomes unsafe. Provide non-coercive housing options for young people experiencing abuse or family rejection of their queer or trans identities. Sham will give us the final. And very importantly, number eight, invest in care, not cops. And I'm gonna be like word for end a lot of what um, Angela Davis says, who by the way, was our very first read for AIDS for Activism, check us out. Um, but she explains that if jails and prisons are to be abolished, then what's going to replace them? And I guess that's a puzzling question that often interrupts further consideration of the prospects of abolition. Because we're so brainwashed in this capitalist society to believing that incarceration is the only solution. And why should it be so difficult to imagine alternatives to incarceration? There are a number of reasons why we tend to talk about the idea that it may be possible to eventually create an entirely different and perhaps a more egalitarian system of justice. And first of all, when we think about the current system with its exaggerated dependence on imprisonment, and especially imprisonment of black people, as an unconditional standard, and we have great difficulty envisioning any other way of dealing with the more than 2 million who are currently being held in US's jails, prisons, youth facilities, and immigration detention centers, and no better in the UK. However, and this is really important now, if we shift our attention from, from the prisons, perceived as an isolated institution, to the set of relationships that comprise the prison industrial complex, it may be easier to start thinking of other alternative, alternatives. And in other, world, in other words, I guess, a multifaceted framework may yield more options for us than if we simply just discover a singular substitute for a prison system. You can't replace incarceration with further incarceration. And the first step of that would then to be um, then to let go of the desire to discover one single alternative system of punishment that would occupy the footprint of the prison system and also let go of the desire of wanting to incarcerate people. It's in our human DNA to forgive. And that's what we need to learn. First and foremost, it's in our human DNA to want to care, to want to protect, not to incarcerate. This is a very horrifying blueprint of capitalism and the neoliberal world. And the alternative would then be to transform schools into vehicles of decarceration. Within the healthcare system, it's also important to emphasize the current scarcity of institutions available to poor people and um, people of color who suffer severe mental and emotional illnesses. There's currently more people with mental illnesses and emotional disorders in prisons and in jails they're not in actual um, institutions which can help them. And this calls for new facilities to be designed to assist poor people that should be taken as an appeal to reinstitute the old system of mental institutions because they don't work very well. Um, 
and in many cases are also as repressive as prisons, but design them to ensure that the racial and class disparities in care available today to the affluent are also available to the deprived and thus creating another vehicle of decarceration. And that's not the only vehicle for decarceration. It's not just schools and um, providing help for mental illnesses. There are several forms of decarceration we can go forward to. And Ain't Can't, Can't Wait lists a few of these. They believe in allocating city funds towards healthcare infrastructures, including non-coercive mental health care, wellness resources, neighborhood-based trauma centers, non-coercive drug and alcohol treatment programming, peer support networks, and training for healthcare professionals that um, make these services available for free to low-income residents and adopt a care not cops model. Invest in teachers. Don't force them and coerce them to have to rat out on their own students. And invest in counselors and in universal childcare and support for all family structures. Make sure that public transport is free and accessible to all. End the use of property taxes to undermine school funding. Install safe and sanitary gender inclusive public restrooms. Ensure the investment in community based food banks, grocery cooperatives, gardens, and farms. Real fruit for the disenfranchised, not the GMO crap that they have to deal with right now. Um, furthermore, ensure free and more extensive public transit, especially servicing marginalized and lower income communities and investing in youth programs that promote learning, promote safety and promote community care. That said, there there is a larger truth that has been confronted, and that is the basic mission of the police remains unchanged. And it was and it's only with tackling that that we can ensure that these eight reforms can be put in. Thank you, Sham. Um, the eight principles are completely amazing. And I know that um, some of it is new to a lot of us hearing this, but abolition is not new, especially in the UK. In the 1970s, there was a group of ex-prisoners and their allies who formed radical alternatives to prisons. That's the name of the group. And it was a pressure group, a pressure and information group that called for the abolition of police and aim to research and propose alternatives to um, to prison. It included a number of um, active local groups. It was supported by the charity Christian Action for a number of years from the 1970s um, onwards. And by 1987, they supported an end to prison building and the decriminalization of certain offenses, legislation to cut maximum offenses and an end to imprisonment for minor offences. Um, they petitioned and um, fought against the building of Holloway Prison. You know, Holloway Prison is one of the largest um, facilities at the moment. The University of Warwick has a whole catalogue of ar archive materials, which include minutes from their meetings. They had an entire journal where they used to talk about these things, but of course, people who tend to call for um, radical change within academic institutions are silenced and i think it's quite interesting um they considered a lot about the eight principles that we've that we've just outlined they considered things like um the role of women within community and how that might have been limiting they considered the fact that women suffered gender-based violences and um and you know thought of solutions to help that and to make sure that the solutions were nuanced and well thought out. So I just wanted to encourage everybody to um, to do more research. Here are the books that we would recommend that you guys use before we go into read, before we go into the closing. We recommend Franz Fanon, Black Skin, White Masks. Who do you protect? Who do you serve? The End of Policing. Are Prisons Obsolete? Um, ja George Jackson, Blood in My Eye, list of organisations, eight can't wait, and please, please, please support the Kingsley campaign and march with them. We have also started a fundraiser for AIDS for Activism because we want to be able to help 
help more people in the community, basically. And we also need to buy books and we need to cover the costs of running the organisation. So please um, donate to our GoFundMe, which will drop the link in the chat sessions. Donate whatever you can. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Sham will um, say goodbye as well. On um, delivering what people are asking for, Amy has asked me to very quickly explain what neoliberalism is and how it works with um prisons in particular and neoliberalism is basically the ideology that governments should be small and businesses should be big and that is that governments leave healthcare education and other services to the private sector which are things such as privatized prisons etc and the problem is is that it doesn't work neoliberals tend to fulfill their vision by cutting government services such as medicare pensions women's shelters and deregulate businesses loosen environmental workers and um, customers' rights, etc., and privatise government assets, which in, in a short-term process makes the government a lot of money, but in a long-term process, they lose out. And ultimately, the rich get richer by owning these assets and the poor get poorer because they can't afford basic water, electric bills, etc., or even um, shelter. And the, again, the issue is that the United States has embraced this, has embraced neoliberalism more than anywhere else in the last 30 years. And it's why the healthcare is in shambles. It's why there are so many people incarcerated today. And it's why inequality has increased. And I say that to say this, police violence now is always and has always been rooted in state sanctioned violence. We must understand that the police violence to be rooted in historical and systematic anti-blackness that seeks to control and contain and repress black people through acts of repeated violence. These issues are intersectional. As mentioned before, G4S makes billions on the profit of incarceration of black people, on the subjugation of Palestinian people fighting apartheid and the humiliation of brown people in detention, in immigration detention centers. And as mentioned before, these same countries ensure that they have the same contracts to train one another, whether it's America or Israel or the UK or Israel, etc. And as Khadija importantly mentioned, we must build the community strength from the ground up. We don't have to put up with aggressive and invasive policing to keep us safe. We don't. Mm. There are alternatives and we can use the power of communities to make our city safer without relying on police, the courts and the prisons. And in, like I said before, indigenous communities such as the Maasai warriors and such as that in the US have taught us the way forward and having preventative measures in and not punishable ones are the way forward. And we need to invest in individuals and communities and transform some of the basic economic and political arrangements in our society. As the Marxist theory mentioned earlier, chemical dependency, traumas, mental health issues, they all play a role in undermining the safety and um, stability of our neighborhoods. People who are suffering need help, not policing, not coercive treatment regimes or self-help um, pabulum. They need access to real services, they need access to real services from trained professionals using evidence-based treatments and personal-centered care. Even children and teens with some of the most personal and serious problems can be helped with sustained and, and intensive engagement and treatment, not be coerced by their mentors or reported by their teachers. They need mentors and counseling and support services for themselves and their families. These wraparound approaches with promising results cost a lot less than cycling the youth and young people in and out of jail or in and out of emergency rooms or in and out of probation and parole and these corrupt, corrupt systems that we have in place now. And in line of making sure we all get to speak of our vision before we run out of time, many have spoke about this. The blueprint is there. Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Angela Davis, Alex Vitar and Vitali, George Jackson, all the groups in the UK as well have developed sophisticated theories about a life without police and without prisons. Two, in, two institutions that are joined in a symbiotic relationship to continuously oppress and marginalize us further. The blueprint is there and it's imperative that we follow it. So if you'd like to join um, A is for Activism, just follow us and learn with us. But I'm going to get Amy to come back in now because we're very close to the closing time. 
Hello, everyone. How do you even go after you guys? Honestly, seriously, thank you so much for sharing. But I think what I want to do to help wrap up um, and like to understand where you, where you, um, what you think, um, like what your dreams are for this, right? Like this is what we're fighting for. Um, and I, I want to kind of start off with asking Ravimbo and Kadisha, and then asking Sham to like um, close up. I think hearing um, Sham's experience and the things that she's talked about always helped to ground uh, this so much more for me, like the real life experience of someone who has been like traversing racist systems and the impact on, on your homeland um, in and, and what neoliberalism has had um, on, on that. And so I want to kind of end with you, but I want to start off with Kadisha and, and um, for you to like, you know, what's your dream? I know you're fighting, uh, fighting hard for justice, but talk to us about your dreams for the future. Um, and then we'll go to Ravimbo and finish with Sham. My dreams for the future? Yeah. Is a question directed to me? Yeah, Kadisha, it's to you, yeah. Okay, so my, my dreams for the future is we want to live in a world where, where we're free from racism, free from being picked upon just in terms of our race colour, want to be able to have our children work, walking down the road and feeling safe and secure. We want accountability. We want to be able to actually see justice being served on a, a, a public platform in terms of moving forward. Because at the end of the day, you have to build on that community trust in terms of how the police police us and how we view the police at the same time. So in order to build that trust and confidence, you have to see changes. And like I said, until changes actually come about, or we have to do those changes ourselves in order for our children to live in, in peace and harmony. Thanks, Kadisha. Thank you so much. And thank you again for sharing um, such, like, such important and um, such personal story with us today. Um, Ravimbo, how about you? I want to see black and brown people be able to just live, just simply exist as they are without any of those restrictions. I want to not be scared for the men and women in my life when they step outside. I want us to be able to, to create art that is rich and isn't um, at, created out of trauma. I want us to just be allowed to be. I want everyone to just leave us alone and like, just let us be, let us breathe, literally. Um, yeah, that's my dream. Thank you so much, Ravimbo. And, and last but not least, Sham. Sham, I think you're muted. Sorry. Um... We all obviously speak from very real lived experiences and horrifying experiences. Um, Kadisha's experiences with the police, I guess my own with war and imperialism. Um, the other comrades that were supposed to join in today to speak about their time during incarceration. And by the way, shout out to Ravimbo who's been able to make this event happen with me whilst dealing with the death of a very personal role model to her. That's incredible. Um, what I want for my future, I guess, is the possibility that children aren't going to have to go through this. And it's very, it's very, very cliche, but I want a future where all children feel loved and nourished and safe. I want liberation for all my comrades, man. I want the end of all imperialist wars as it goes. I want adequate housing and warmth and food for all. I want all to have access to literacy. And I, I want the end and dismantlement of capitalism as a whole. But most importantly for me, I suppose, is centering children at that, the centre and making sure they're the ones that are protected and they're the ones that are loved and they're the ones that are nourished, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And the future where they can just, as I remember said, just exist. I think you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> um, we've had, thank you so much for sharing. Um, we've, we've had so many great 
comments in the chat um and so many people who are just like thanking you guys for for this session and how glad they are to have tuned in um and i want to say thank you to you all for tuning in and um, hannah abdi has written a, a comment at the end which is a, a quote of huey p newton and i think maybe it's a good one to to finish off and read um and it says we have two evils to fight capitalism and racism we must destroy both racism and capitalism and she goes on to say huey p newton is one of her favorite role models um and i feel like that's like um you know so much of this whole festival has been um just full of incredible um contributions and and this one was so both real and rooted in um such important deep concepts and i want to thank you all for that i want to thank you for your time for your research and often as well for like reliving um trauma and things that um you know are not part of how our imaginations uh thrive and i'm grateful to you for it now um i'm gonna um pass back over one second to sham to say um sham or Avimbo, whoever would like to um and kadisha i was wondering like if everyone can just give a call to action right because kadisha i know there's a campaign in the uk that supports um uh families who are going through the injustices or fighting for justice like uh, you have been and I was wondering if you could just everyone could do a call for action about who they should follow and who they should support um and and then we'll start to wrap up the festival um Kadisha um yeah so can you tell us a little bit more about um what we should support in the UK to support uh, justice for your brother and so many other people um going through um the same uh, fights for justice thank you Okay, so in order to call for action, I'm calling for everyone, everyone who, who's got that initiative within them in order to move forward. Um, join the United Friends and Family campaign. We have a march every single year on the 26th of October, and we march to 10 Downing Street. Because at the end of the day, it's our call for action in order for things to be seen and done and actually changed in terms of politically. So in terms of moving forward, I would just encourage and urge everyone who's out there to do the best that they can to, can do in order to move forward in this because it's not just for the families for the community and our future generations who are living these experiences that we want to change for all thanks kadisha thank you so much um okay i suppose with us um on Twitter, we're A's for Activism. On Instagram, we're A's for Activism BC. As Bivumbo said, we have we now have a goal for you. If you can share that and donate whatever you can, as little as a pound is fine, we're going to make sure that we use the money and we're going to be completely transparent, putting all receipts on a Google Drive for you all, um, and showing that we're going to be delivering community-based programs such as the Black Panthers did, such as the young Viet Cong did in Vietnam, and following that similar model, but doing it in Birmingham and even on an international basis, like we did with the Yemen fundraiser, et cetera. So just follow the ASFAX with some pages and yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Okay, and I'm just gonna reiterate that to wrap up this session. You won't regret following AIDS for Activism, okay, like in every way, it will school you every day, it will support you every day, it's full of love and care and truth, and truth is, uh, and truths, um, and that is so, so important, and we haven't got time to talk about it today, and I'd really love to welcome um, uh, anyone who would like to from AIDS for Activism BC back to talk about um, uh, Yemen and the, and the, like, absolutely crisis level of, of things we need to talk about in Yemen, like quickly and how much everyone needs to care about this, right? And and I really hope we can do something about that quickly, but follow A's for Activism and support them because honestly, they are revolutionaries and they're doing the work and they're doing it from lived experience and uh, with real uh, imagination and like force of completely just like dismantling and, um, and yeah, they're just incredible. And we're so grateful. And um, I can see Liz Pemberton in the audience, which I know will make Sham happy. So big up, big up the educators. Um, and so that's it. Like that's the festival, right? And what an incredible way to like finish it off with local revolutionaries 
right here in Birmingham doing the work and who've been doing the work for for years. Um, solidarity to you all, a lot of love and Kadisha, like we will make sure that we keep sharing and we keep trying to connect and figure out what more we can do. I hope you all sit on this panel and everyone in the audience stay safe during these times. Um, despite what the government says, we're still in a pandemic, right? It hasn't been downgraded yet. So please take care of yourselves, take care of your families and reach out, reach out if you're struggling, right? These support mechanisms are here for us to support each other with, with whatever you might need. Reach out to each other, connect, uh, say what's happening in your life because we can't, we can't talk about massive like international uh, um, toppling and dismantling of systems if we can't help each other uh, in times like that.